Hey guys, Mr. Backberg here. Lesson 1.4 is all about an introduction to functions. So we've got three objectives we're going to work with. Number one says we're going to determine whether relations between two variables are functions. Two, we are going to use function notation and evaluate functions. And then number three, we're going to take a look at finding some domains of functions. But before we actually get into functions, I want to take a look at this equation and just kind of talk about what it means and what it represents. So we're looking at the equation y equals x squared plus 1. What this equation is, or really what any equation is, is it relates, in this case, some x value that we're going to plug into this equation to its y value answer that we get back. And we typically represent those things as ordered pairs, okay, x comma y. Okay, so we're plugging in some x value and we get back some y value answer. Now there's another way to think about this. Since we're plugging in these x values, we can call those things input values. Uh, and since we get back, the answer we get back is this y value, I'm going to call this our output value. Okay, so this equation is just relating some input x value to its output y value. So we can make an x and y chart for this. You know, we plug in 1 for our x value. Well, 1 squared is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. You know, if we plug in 2, 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. And so on and so forth. We could keep going with that. Well, all a function is is a special kind of equation. Now, I've got the textbook definition of a function there. It says it's a relation that assigns each element in the set a, uh, which for our cases we're going to call our x values, to exactly one element in the set B, which will be our y values. Okay, so we're going from some x value, that'll be like our input, to exactly one y value output answer. And the example I'm going to use to kind of describe and talk about how we figure out if something is a function or how we tell something is a function is by relating time to a measure of temperature. So let's say we were going to go outside and we were just going to measure the temperature at some different times. Now I'm just going to use like four different times. So maybe we got up and we measured the temperature at 7 o'clock this morning. Um, and then maybe we measured it also at 10 o'clock. Uh, and I'm going to use some military times here. So at 2 o'clock that would be like 14. I don't want to use 2 because we could mix up some numbers. Um, and then let's say we measured it at 10 o'clock at night. Well, if we think about the 24-hour cycle, 10 o'clock at night would be like hour 22 in a day. Okay, so I just went ahead and wrote down four different temperatures. So let's say that we went outside at 7 o'clock this morning. We measured the temperature, and it was 68 degrees. So I'm just going to match those two things up. Then at 10 o'clock, we went outside, took the measurement again. Uh, a little bit later in the day, it's starting to warm up. So maybe now it's 74 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and match those ones up. Uh, 14 represented 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, middle of the day, starting to get pretty warm. So maybe it's 82 degrees out. So let's go ahead and match those ones up. Uh, and then the last one, 22 degrees. You know, it's nighttime, it's starting to cool off. Maybe it's back down to 68 degrees. So I'm going to match up uh, the 22, because that was 10 o'clock at night, with the 68. So what we're going to do is, I've got four different characteristics of a function listed out. Uh, the first two are kind of the things that make a function an actual function. The last two are just kind of things that can happen, um, not always, but sometimes. So we're going to use this time and temperature example uh, to help us represent or talk about what a function actually is. Okay, so the first thing that makes a function a function, it says each element in set A has to be matched with an element in set B. So that means every time we go outside, we have to take a temperature measurement. So at 7 o'clock, we took a measurement. That's matched up with something. At 10 o'clock, we took a measurement. 14 and 22. Okay, all of those elements in A, which are like our X values. Let me just write that up here. A is like our X values or the time. B is like our Y values or the temperature. Each X has a Y. The next thing, number two, says each element in A cannot be matched with two different elements in B. Okay, That wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense. 
Like, if you went outside at 7 o'clock and measured the temperature, it's only going to be one temperature. Okay, you can't have two different temperatures at one time. So each x, okay, each thing in A, each x, can't be matched with two different y values. So remember, I said these first two things are the really, really important ones. These are the things that make a function a function. Each x has to be matched up with a y. Okay, each thing in A has to be matched up with something in B. And each x can only have one y. So that was like number two down here. Each A can't be matched up with two different things from B. Now these last two characteristics are just kind of things that could happen. So the first thing that could happen is there might be an element in B that's not matched with anything. So like I've got 23 written up here. Well, at any of those times that we went outside and measured the temperature, it wasn't 23 degrees. And that's okay, we can run into that. It's not gonna affect whether this thing is a function. It's just the first two things that are really important. Okay, step one here and step two. The other thing that we could run into, which is totally okay, is there might be two or more elements in A that are matched up with the same thing in B. So seven o'clock was matched up with 68 degrees and 22 or 10 o'clock at night was also matched up with 68 degrees. Totally fine, that's not gonna affect whether this thing is a function or not. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use those first two characteristics to decide whether some relationships are in fact functions, okay? So here we're given a table of values. We're given some input values and we're given some output values. So I'm gonna call our inputs X just because that's what we're used to working with and I'm gonna call our outputs Y's because again, that's just what we're used to working with. Uh, so the first characteristic said that each X has to have a Y. So if we look at this, you know, two, this X value of two is matched up with a Y value. Three is matched up with a Y value. Four is matched up with something. Five is matched up with something. So we're good as far as that number one goes, okay? Each X has a Y. Number two said that each X can have only one Y. So if we look at this x value of two, okay, it's only matched up with negative two. I don't see any other two input values, so we're good there. Three is only matched up with zero, four is only matched up with one, and five is only matched up with negative one. Each x has only one y, so we're good there. Okay, so what that means is, yes, this table of values represents a function. Okay, yes, it's a function. So here again, we're given some values. Uh, we're given some values in set A and some values in set B. We're gonna figure out if this thing represents a function. Uh, so A is gonna represent like our X values, B is gonna be our Y values. So we're checking. Number one says, uh, is each X matched up with a Y? So is two matched up with something? Yep, right here. Okay, is three matched up? Yep, four and five is also used. Okay, now we're checking number two. Okay, does each X have only one Y? Well, let's look at two. Two is matched up with zero right here, but if we look a little bit further down the line, two is also matched up with negative one. So that X value of two is matched up with two different Y values. Okay, that's not okay. So no, this one is not a function. We can also figure out if something is a function just by looking at its equation. So we're given this equation, x squared plus y squared equals eight. And we're supposed to check if this thing represents a y as a function of x. Well, what that means is we're gonna try to get y equals. We're gonna try to get y all by itself. So let's just go ahead and do that. Let's look at our equation and get y all by itself. So I guess the first thing we would do is subtract the x squared over. So then our equation would say y squared equals negative x squared plus eight. And then if we were gonna get y all by itself, we'd take the square root of both sides. So left-hand side is now just a plain old y value equals. Remember, when we do the square root, we have to remember that plus or minus in front of there. So it's plus or minus the square root of negative x squared plus eight. And now we have to determine if this thing is a function. Okay, and where we're gonna run into an issue, just like we did on the last example, is with each x having only one y value. And the reason we're going to run into an issue is this plus or minus right here. 
because what this is saying is when we plug in an x value, we're going to get a positive answer, but then we're also going to get a negative answer. So we have the same x value being matched up with two different y values, one positive, one negative. So that automatically makes this one not a function. I'm going to use this example that we talked about earlier, y equals x squared plus 1. This is in fact a function. We could run through and check uh, the first and the second characteristics. It works out. I'm going to use this example to talk about something called function notation. And this is a way that we just represent these equations to tell other people that the thing we're looking at is in fact a function. And really the only change we make is we get rid of this y value thing over here and we use this f of x notation. Okay, That signifies that this thing we're taking a look at is a function. So if we talk about those ordered pairs, we usually deal with ordered pairs in like an x comma y format. Well again, the only thing that's changing, it's still going to be x comma, but instead of that y value, now we've got this f of x. Okay, So this is still going to represent our input but now this f of x thing, like our y value that we got rid of, now using f of x, is our output. We've already seen a few different ways uh, to represent a function. There are actually four different ways to represent a function. We can represent functions verbally, algebraically, numerically, and graphically. So I've got examples of all of them up there, and they're actually the same exact example just represented in different ways. So verbally we could say the output is the sum of the input squared plus one. So really what that's saying is algebraically speaking we've got f of x using function notation equal to x squared plus one. The output is equal to the input squared plus one. Numerically we could come up with a table of values. Negative two is matched up with five, negative one is matched up with two, zero and one, one and two, two and five. And then graphically, we would just take all of those ordered pairs from our table and graph them out. So far, we've defined functions. We've taken a look at relationships and determined if they are functions. We even looked at four different ways to represent functions. But what we're going to do now is we're going to look at actually using functions and evaluating functions, figuring things out based on functions. So we're given this function f of x equals 10 minus 3x squared. And we're using some function notation. And what we're asked to do here is evaluate these things. So what we're going to look at first is this f of 2. Now what that means is in our function where we had this x value, we're just going to replace it with a 2. So on the right hand side of our equation, we'd have 10 minus 3 times here is an x. So we plug in the 2 squared. Okay, and now it's just down to doing the arithmetic, okay, figuring out what this thing actually is. So 2 squared is 4, 4 times 3 is 12. So we're looking at 10 minus 12, which we know is negative 2. If we look at f of negative 4, again, this is just saying replace the x in the equation with a negative 4. So we've got 10 minus 3 times negative 4 squared. Well, negative 4 squared is 16. 16 times 3 is 48. So we're looking at 10 minus 48. So we get negative 38. The last one might look a little bit more complicated, but we're just going to keep doing what we've been doing. We're going to replace the x in our equation with what's inside of the parentheses. So in this case, x minus 1. So we've got 10 minus 3 times x minus 1 squared. And that's it. Just replace the x in the equation with what's ever inside of your parentheses right here. The last thing we need to talk about for this video is the domain and the range of a function. So I've got a couple of definitions up there for each of those things. The domain, it says, is the set of all values, inputs, of the independent variable for which the function is defined. Okay, So we can think about, if you look at down below, we can think about the domain as all of our input values or our x values that are okay to use in our equation. Now there are a couple of things that we need to be careful about as far as like undefined values go. And the two main ones that we think about when we think about undefined values 
are taking square roots of negative numbers. Okay, remember that's not allowed to do. And also having zero on the bottom of a fraction or dividing by zero. Those are things that would be considered undefined values. And then as far as the range goes, that's the set of all of our output values assumed by the dependent variable. So we think about those outputs as our y values. So range is related to our y values. Okay, domain is x, range is y. So I've got two functions we're going to take a look at, and we're going to find the domain of each of those functions. Okay, so remember, domain is related to the x values that are safe to plug in. Uh, looking at the first one, it says g of x is equal to the square root of x minus 16. Now we said one of those big domain issues that we could run into is taking the square root of a negative number. So what we're going to do in order to find the domain of this one is we're going to make sure that the stuff underneath the square root isn't a negative number. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure the stuff underneath our radical, underneath the square root, this x minus 16 stuff, we're going to make sure that's not negative by saying that it has to be greater than 0. It could also equal 0 uh, because we can take the square root of 0, it's just 0. So now what we're going to do to find the domain of this thing is we're just going to solve for x. Okay, We're going to add this 16 over and we get x has to be greater than or equal to 16. And that's it, we got x all by itself. There's our domain. Our domain is all of the x values that are greater than or equal to 16. For our last example, we're given a bunch of ordered pairs. Okay, we've got four zero, negative three two, nine eight, and seven one. And again, we're gonna figure out the domain. Well, just like we said before, domain is related to the x values. So the domain of this function is the x values. So I'm gonna just write them down in numerical order. So negative three is the smallest x value, then four, then seven, then nine, okay? There's our domain, there's the x values. So that is it as far as this video goes. Please remember to fill out the Google form linked in the description down below and thanks for watching.